I'm George Reister. He's Ralph Amson, and this is the Pac-12 Apostles. All right, this week is a crazy week because there was another coach fired in the Pac-12, and that is Carl Durrell. We will talk about that. What is Stanford's next move with David Shaw? Uh, go over week five, recap, and then week six, preview, and of course, our power rankings. And for sure, leave a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts. Send us an email, a text message. I'm mad at unafraidshow.com. And of course, we will address your issue or whatever you have to say. Um, but I want to start, though, with the firing of Carl Durrell. Now, I think we all saw this coming at Colorado, right? Yes. I saw this coming the day he hired Mike Sanford to be his offensive coordinator. And I think I even said it on Twitter. I was like, this is your king? This is the guy you picked instead of Brennan Marion? That this is going to be Carl Durrell's undoing and that this hire was going to be the one that to, to get him fired. And that's the man that they named interim head coach. What the hell are they doing at Colorado? I don't know. Like I look at, obviously it's a cumulative issue, but I look at Mike Sanford as the reason Carl Durrell got fired. The reason. So why, why is he being elevated and why are we getting op eds from the Denver post that, that say like Mike Sanford isn't Carl Durrell. He's fired up and he's hungry. Um, <laughs> Or, or there's another one from uh, the fan 104.3 FM in Colorado uh, that Mike Sanford is a nice change of pace and full of energy. Let me be really clear here. The best defense in the Pac-12 belongs to Utah. They have surrendered 72 points on the season collectively. That is the best defense in the Pac-12. Colorado has scored 67 points on offense. They are worse on offense than the best defense is good at defense, at least scoring defense. Colorado is not only 0-5, they're 0-5 against an ever-increasing spread. They're 0-5 against the spread. Colorado is out here making yes. people rich. If you whatever whatever they make the spread, Colorado, don't, don't worry. They will obliterate it. Uh, when, I, when, when Minnesota was getting 27 points, that felt like a million. Like it, it, like you would have <laughs> thought that that would have been too many, but it was not, not even close. Like he was chased out of town at his previous job, chased at, out of town. at Minnesota. Most people, when they let a coach go. The attitude is like somber. I wish it could have worked out. Yada, yada, yada. PJ Fleck was like, don't let the door hit you. And <laughs> then they played each other. Then they played each other. And PJ Fleck made sure to make a huge statement when Minnesota played Colorado this year. Yep. I just, I, I don't, I don't understand what they're doing. It's the worst offense in college football. And they promoted the offensive coordinator to interim head coach. And people in Colorado are treating this the same as people in Tempe or people in Madison, where the interim coach actually might have a vision of how to move things forward. That's this is not that. This is this isn't that at all. Even even Lincoln, even in Lincoln, the attitude that in the interim selection might make sense. Definitely in Madison, where Jim Leonard oh, yeah. is one of the most beloved Wisconsin Badgers of all time. Oh yeah, but he's he's but absolutely Mike's, getting that job. I don't mean to disparage Mike Sanford as a person. I don't know anything about him. I just know what the results are and the idea that him and like anyone, anyone, but him. Yeah. He had anybody. one of the worst offenses in the entire country last year at Minnesota. One of the worst. So I don't even know how Carl D Durrell was like, yeah, that's the guy I want right there. He had other options. Like, that wasn't his only option. I would have hired a dude that has never been an offensive coordinator before but had played in dynamic offenses in terms of coached in dynamic systems, 
had a title of like pass game coordinator or something. I would have hired him way before. Like Mike Sanford would have been so far down the list of guys that I would have hired. Yeah, and I tell you what, if you are trying to get a job, hire somebody who works at a collegiate sports information directory office to write your resume. You you absolutely need to because the things that they find to attribute to a coach, uh, whether it's just players that they lucked into having around obscure statistics, if you pull up any coach's resume, any their bio, which serves as a resume, yeah. if you pull up any coach's bio, no matter how bad they are, after reading their bio, you are going to be convinced that they are the greatest coach of all yes. time. Facts. And I'm sitting here, like, I'm reading Mike Sanford's bio right now. And keep in mind, was <laughs> chased out of Minnesota, and it was like a good riddance situation and is currently the head of the worst offense in all of college football that led to the dismissal of Carl Durrell, right? I'm going to yep. read you. I'm going to read you some of the highlights. Um, and, and And again, they give you credit for things that are just absurdly out of your control. Because at one point, Mike Sanford Jr. was the recruiting coordinator of Stanford. Stanford doesn't need a recruiting coordinator. (laughs) Because kids just, if you offer a kid that wants to go to Stanford, they go to Stanford. Uh, David Shaw said that within, uh, that with, with the whole time he's been a head coach, Kids that have wanted to come to Stanford that because you have to apply to Stanford like you, you just don't get recruited. You then have to apply. He said maybe a handful of guys that have applied and got in did not come. Maybe a handful. Right. So they're giving him credit for Deshaun Kaiser and Ian Book at Notre Dame. They're giving him credit for getting Kevin Hogan to Stanford. They're giving 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 him credit for getting Christian McCaffrey to Stanford. They're giving him credit for getting Ryan Finley to Boise State. And if anybody remembers, Ryan Finley had like a, a minor in possession and then transferred to NC State and then went to the NFL. Yes. Um. They're giving they're giving him credit for Ch- Chase Claypool and Equinemia St. Brown what? at Notre Dame, another place that recruits itself. Uh. And. And, and this is how they describe his 2001 Minnesota offense. And again, he was fired. In, two, in 2021, San, Sanford oversaw a Minnesota offense that ran the ball a majority of the time. And despite losing three of its top running backs, still averaged 194 uh, yards per game to rank 31st in the NCAA. Minnesota was 8-4, and four, including a 30 nothing win over Colorado and Boulder, where Sanford's offense rushed for 277 yards and possessed the ball over 22 minutes in the second half, thwarting any comeback attempt by the Buffaloes. The Gophers were also 15th nationally in fewest turnovers, 17th in third down conversions, and 27th in red zone offense. How about the passing <laughs> offense? How about the total offense? How about, yeah, like, come on. Like, Minnesota has the same quarterback, the same running back this year. Ah, all of a sudden, it looks it looks different. Hmm. Okay, it's so. It's got his, what, that he coached at Western Kentucky, but you'll notice it didn't mention his record. Correct. It mentions how many all league players he had. It mentions how many players eventually went to the NFL. It mentions how many players, 39, by the way, that had a 3.0 or higher. Because, does not because he's helping record. them out in that classroom. <laughs> he's he's leading yeah. the study hall. Okay, so Colorado is averaging 13.4 points per game. 13.4. And their total offense is 277 yards per game. Um, Guess who the second worst is? Who? So they're at 277. Just, just actually just guess the number of yards for the next closest offense. I'm going to guess it's probably 340, 350. Yep. 344 at Arizona state. And, and, (laughs) And then the and next, mind you, mind you, Arizona State also fired its coach, and Arizona State has played three of the top eleven teams in the country. Yes, and that's not what Colorado's schedule looks correct. like. Correct, and they are. Uh, and then the next closest is three eighty, and then it goes all the way up to five oh six. So they're not even. And then points per game. As I told you, they're at thirteen point four. Guess who the next closest is? Well, well just a number. 
18, 19? Nope, 23. 10 whole points, oh bro, God. at Arizona State. Dude. That is putrid. So, so the question is. They're on who- their third starting quarterback. Yep. They're on their third starting quarterback. Two weeks in a row, University of Arizona gave up 300 yards rushing. And last week, Colorado managed for 150. Now, they were down, but still. Yeah. Uh, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay, I, if so, he is in the running to be their head coach, they, <laughs> they deserve. They deserve whatever they get. So who should be the the in the running for them as head coach? Well, the Brennan Marion situation is weird, and that worried me as an Arizona State fan. P.S. I got a very hot take when we get to Arizona State about their coaching situation. But the Brennan Marion thing was like, well, you had a chance to have him as your offensive coordinator. Are you going to replace Mike Sanford with Brennan Marion? Like, because that I mean, that would be ultimate um, uh, kind of weird move. Um, I there are a couple of people. Th- First of all, I was dead serious last week when I said throw the bag at Jed Fish because you actually have yes, yes, evidence he knows somebody... how to yeah reclaim yeah, a broken yeah, Jed... product. <laughs> Jed Fish knows how to dig up. Yes. <laughs> like, so, dude. So, I, I, I'm I wasn't afraid, kidding about that. I'm afraid that Colorado is going to go to the scratch and dent bin. That they are going to try to pay, throw the bag at like Matt Rule when he gets fired, or or no. somebody else. Like, I, it's going to be a sketchy hire instead of somebody young and inno- innovative. But, that that feels like that's the direction that it's going. I feel like Arizona State, on the other hand, is going to be more innovative, probably, and more younger. Somebody who, you know, like can provide some energy. I think that that's the way Arizona State's going to go. I think Colorado is going to take the much more conservative approach and fail again. Well, what do you think about Dan Mullen? What do you think about Dan Mullen for Colorado? Some of these guys that that are actually taking a year off. Um, that have been that have been out of the game. Um, you know, he's one of them. Um, Coach Orgeron. Orgeron, absolutely not. Absolutely no. freaking not, dude. He can't bring all the women to the uh, practice. So, so no. Okay. He's living okay. his best but- life right right now. I think there are guys that did get booted out of the last cycle. Okay. What about Paul Christ? Or do you think he's done? Because when you get fired by your alma mater, it's a little bit different. Like if you get, if you get booted, then you might not necessarily have the motivation to go somewhere else. So I'm, I don't know. I might throw him out. Paul Um, Christ. I would not. The only reason why I wouldn't hire Paul Chris is because he didn't have a recruiting department for like six months there. So I don't know how interested yeah. he, he is in recruiting, which is a problem. What about a guy like what about a guy like Kenny Dillingham, whose interest like, let's say that obviously he's interested in Arizona State. I know for a fact Arizona State's interested in him. But if they go a different direction and, you know, the best he can do is become a head coach, why would he not take that that opportunity? I think that's something that um, they could look at. They did mention that they want they, – they did do the Arizona State thing, like young, energetic, and then now they're using words like energy to describe Mike Sanford. You need more than energy. You need somebody who can actually draw up a play that works. Um and you need a you need a roster overhaul. If you're on that roster, you got to understand bringing in a new coach. The NCAA rules allow people to cut. Yes, they allow All you right, to cut. Whoever, gets, whoever comes in is going to cut like 20 players off this roster. Oh yeah, you you already know that's happening. So we will see who they hire. Now on to Stanford. I th- we both respect David Shaw, right? But what yes. is happening at or at Stanford? Because they beat Oregon last last year, and that felt like an anomaly. Like that felt like a bunch of things came right on the same day for them. Officer coordinator being hurt, 
Mario Cristobal liking to play ball, how he likes to play ball offensively. A lot of things factored into that. And they had a couple penalties go their way and stuff like that. So the, the question is, is if you are Stanford with the results of the past few years, what do you do? What do you do? Because it's a tough place to recruit. They only have one transfer in. I, how, how do you, like, do you keep David Shaw? Do you, because I'm like, if I'm them, I don't fire David Shaw because I know how hard it, it's going to be to get another head coach. But at the same time, I, I probably force him to hire a new offensive coordinator, somebody young, innovative, that's not going to do what's what's been going on. Because since 2018, well, since, yeah, 2018 Stanford, well, actually 2017, they went 9-5. and five. And... Nine and five, nine and four, four and eight, and then four and two the COVID year, three and nine, and now they're one and three. So it's like all those the the, the first years. So he took over for uh, Jim Harbaugh in 2011. So 11, 12, uh, 13, they won 11, 12, and 11 games. Then they won eight games in 2014, and then 12 in 2015, and 10 and uh, 2016. So you can't blame this all on, you know, Jim Harbaugh was there. He got things rolling and, and no, cause David Shaw brought his own recruiting classes in all of that. So what has happened now? And I think that the game has passed his philosophy by not that they don't have good enough players, even though they do need better players. Yeah, it is on the stances that David Shaw has taken are honorable they're not yes. sensible but they are honorable stanford is stanford you're not going to be able to easily grad transfer in you're not easily going to be able to get into grad school now that eligibility has been extended if you were on a certain academic track you're not going to be able to take advantage of the transfer portal and the early signing day kills you yep um so you you have all of these things the stances he's taking are honorable they are not necessarily practical or sensible. I have less sympathy for him going out like the last samurai, knowing that he's the highest paid coach in the conference, or at least the second highest paid coach in the conference. You could get somebody into Stanford for one third of his salary and reinvest 7 million into the health and welfare of Stanford's athletes and making yep. sure that it's a world-class unique experience because they also do. And you've pointed out multiple times, they do treat the players much more like college kids than they need to. Yes. Um, yes. They treat them exactly the same way as they treat everybody else on campus, but they're not because their schedule demands are not the same. And there are no professors making 10 plus million dollars a year on Correct. campus. David Shaw is. Correct. So I think, I think that it's possible that it's time to move on. The other thing that I see that could actually uh, delay Stanford's demise, because they are 12 and 22 over the last four seasons. And if any other coach in the conference and any other school in the conference had that track record, we would be talking about, is it time to fire the coach? Yeah. Like, that wasn't even Herm Edwards' record. That wasn't even Herm Edwards' record. So I the, the what I see is there is one thing that could delay, not cancel, but delay the demise of Stanford, and that is moving to the Big 12, or the Big 10. I'm sorry, the Big 10. If they are able to move to the Big 10, they could probably go back to some of the offensive – they could, they could be competitive. Eventually, there'll be another Vanderbilt. That's yes. just the the, the yeah. cards that have been dealt by the NCAA and the standards that Stanford has set. Uh, but if they're going to remain in the Pac-12 and they're going to pay David Shaw $10 million a season, and he's not going to uh, uh, change out any assistant coaches. He's going to continue to treat college kids like they're just regular students, and the NCAA rules are going to continue to negatively affect Stanford. There's no way out of this, No, in my opinion. No, no. Change is the only way. You you will always have good players at Stanford, though. Yep. Because like like the current interim head coach at uh, at Arizona State, Sean Aguano once said when he was the head coach of Chandler High School and they were 
on their run of winning state championships, he said, I would love for my kids to stay in state, but if Stanford offers my kid, I'm taking the pen out of my son's hand and signing his name for him. <laughs> you are right about that. All right, uh, Washington at UCLA. Let's get to the games. Washington 32, UCLA 40. Washington made a late surge, 16 points in the fourth quarter, but this game was not even close. This game was not even close. At the end of the third quarter, it was 40 to 16. 40 to 16. Uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson got on an absolute heater. He was like at the craps table and he kept hitting his point, buddy. The defense kept hitting their point. Everything, dude. They, this felt like the equivalent of of you going to the to a casino and saying, my favorite number is 33. Put it on 33. And then you win. You're like, let it all ride on 33 again. You hit it again. Then you're like, let's let it all ride on 33 again. You hit it three times in a row. And then you, and then instead of doing it a fourth time, you take the money and run. That's what UCLA did. They didn't go broke. <laughs> and they are now five and zero. Oh. Zach Charbonnet was really good. Dorian Thompson Robinson was pretty good. And we found out that, that Washington is mortal. Yes. Uh, a couple of things about this game. This is the third time. Third time. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong. This is the third time I've seen Dorian Robin, uh, Thompson Robinson turn into Superman. Oh, against USC last year. Against USC last year. And then that insane game against Washington State. Oh, when We're they when they came North. back from, <laughs> yes. yeah, that was insane. Yes, then they won in the sixties. Yeah, yeah, that was silliness. So now it's a it's one of those things where like, it, dude, this could happen yep. at any time. It's pot. I, I was blown away by how easily UCLA moved the ball, no matter what they did, especially in that first half. Yeah, it was like 20, cutting I, cutting butter with a hot yeah. knife. It was, it was, and I, I was shocked. And then defensively, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I saw. It really felt like they were looking at some of those rainbow throws that Michael Penix makes. And they said, uh, they looked at their safeties and they said, all right, just stay home. Make it look like you're playing too deep. But if you stay home, you're going to have a chance to step up and pick up, pick off one of those throws. And I thought that was a good strategy. And then Michael Penix still figured out what to do toward the end of the game. He still threw for over 300 yards and four touchdowns. He still looks really, really good, but he he had an adjustment to make. And I felt like just a great game plan all around by UCLA shocked me because I think I had them outside the top six in our power rankings last week. And I, I had mentioned that I thought I told that they you were so. Fraudulent. Turns out South Alabama is pretty damn good. Yep. By the way, I was at that and, game. And uh, <laughs> turns out they're good. And uh, and and maybe we should have been given UCLA credit for for getting that win at home, um, and and overcoming fumbling problems to even yeah. be in that situation in the first place. Um, the other thing that stuck out to me uh, about this game in particular is that UCLA can stop the run. Yeah, yeah, because they held Washington to. 3.4 3.1 yards a carry and but for their backs like f about 4 yards a carry. Yeah, that and that after watching what Arizona State did against USC this last week makes me it, it really makes me wonder if that if Washington can't get this right they might start to slide. You know, I thought they'd be oh, 6 and when, 2 or 7 and 1 heading into Oregon but oh, well and and then it does make you wonder how much of Washington's schedule permitted them to, to look the way that they did, which is the same criticism that people had about UCLA because they played Kent State, Portland State, uh, Michigan State, and Stanford. Stanford's terrible. Portland State and Kent State are who they are, and Michigan State is not looking good at all this year. So, so – and then they lose to UCLA. So I'm not even sure if we know who Washington is yet. I think yeah. that they can be a high powered offense, but they can also like they were looking untouchable. And now you're like, hmm, they are mere mortals. 
uh, and and speaking of uh, speaking of Washington, though, it's it's it is no fluke what they're doing offensively. No, um, defensively is is now what has come into question. But Michael Penix Jr., who has been this is his fifth year playing college football, getting meaningful snaps, he is has already reached his career high in yardage in a season. Do you believe that? Yeah, because he's never finished a season. But the fact he's already at 1,700 yards passing and his previous high was 2020, 1,645. He's also thrown more touchdowns this year than in any other season. He threw 16 hey, this year. Kalen DeBoer is a good situation. <laughs> yeah, he is. If you can throw the rock, you're you going to have that opportunity, brother. You're going to have that opportunity. All right. Um, now, Oregon State, who was mad two weeks ago, their game against USC didn't get put on national television, and neither did the Utah game. Well, the USC game should have absolutely been on national television. That was a good game to watch. But this game against Utah, they got their ass kicked. 16-42. to 42. Utah abs- just opened up a can of whoop-ass, and I think we figured out uh, Oregon State does not have a quarterback at all. Chan- Chance Nolan threw another two interceptions. Um, after throwing, I think four, the, the pre yeah, against USC the previous week, uh, Gold Goldbrinson, who I didn't even know was on the roster. Cause I thought <laughs> Jebbia or, uh, you know, or Throckmorton or somebody else was going to be in front of, in front of him, but nope, he came in through another two, two picks. They have to figure something out at quarterback, bro. They have to figure something out. Yes, and Chance Nolan, who has now thrown like six straight interceptions, and somebody on Twitter called him a turnover philanthropist, which <laughs> instead of a turnover machine, call him a philanthropist. A turn- that's tough he right just there. Giving bro. things away. Yeah, that's brutal. Um, but he has been limited in practice. He's got a neck injury. And now so now they're having a split reps, which is gonna be tough um between ben colbranson and chance nolan it almost makes you wonder should we just bring jack coletto back since he already <laughs> does the short yardage duties and, and plays linebacker we just have... it, maybe maybe um they ran the ball okay against utah this is just utah's just this good uh and i think that it's, it's if you gave utah hell last year <laughs> kyle whittingham started game planning the next day. Yep. And so <laughs> it's, they're running through people right now. And I, I definitely respect, I, I really respect what they're doing. The, the emergence of Devon Vele, uh, yeah, he it, looks it has made Utah that much more dangerous. And I don't know. I think Oregon state's going to be all right. There were a lot of people that were a lot higher on them than you and I were. And we talked all off season about how the quarterback position was going to be the one thing that holds them back. So no surprises for me in this game. Um, I think we both took Utah to cover last week. So I, it, but the fact that they kept their foot on the gas pedal in the second half was, was interesting. They, this is a 21 to three second half. Um, and it just goes to show that 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 Utah knows, especially after that Florida game, they have to finish games. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think that just like the Oregon game was a wake up call for, uh, well, that the Georgia game was a wake up call for Oregon. This was definitely that was definitely a wake up call for Utah as well. Because I got a chance to talk to um, Kyle Whittingham after that game, and he was like, "Listen." We didn't stop the quarterback run. We didn't stop the run well enough. Thought we handled the environment well, but this is something that we got to grow from. And, you know, we, and I thought that they were like, yeah, yeah. And, and Utah, who looks to play a conservative style of offense, they don't, they don't get in struggle matches. They knock you the hell out. Yep. All right. Um, and going into this week, I want to point out going into this week, Clark Phillips was getting hype as one of the best defensive players in the Pac-12, and what happens often when you're Three getting hyped is you don't a pick up. six. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's called living up to to the hype. He is, he he right now is like far and away in the lead for the defensive player of the year in the conference. Yep. All right. Uh, Cal at Washington State. This was a uh, Cal 9, Washington State 28. This is one of the and see, and I feel bad, right? On 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 some level, 
because I've had to, because of this podcast and because of my job, I've had to say some honest things about some people that I like. And their offensive coordinator over at Cal, their defensive coordinator, and their head coach, who are all Oregon guys. Two of them I played with. And one of them was my offensive coordinator in Jacksonville. So, it has hurt me. And it's probably hurt our relationships as well. Because, uh, because uh, yeah, because I saw Justin at Pac-12 Media Day, and he seemed, seemed real happy with me. And, um, and I text our OC. He ain't text back. So I was like, oh, well, you know, it is okay. You know, I, I, don't, I don't condemn them as people, but as football coaches, there's a certain standard. You need to be better. And, 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 the, and I've never said that Justin Wilcox is a bad coach. Never. I just said I didn't, didn't want him coaching Oregon. Unless he yeah. was going to be surrounded by top-tier recruiters. And I was like, there's no way that he's going to leave, you know, uh, Peter Sermon – there like no way no way who's one of his best friends played with him at Oregon there's no way and some of his other staff so I you know it is what it is man you he's got a situation at Cal and Jack Plummer was efficient throwing the ball he was 23 for 33 and Washington State's defense which has not been like super stout against the pass just just did a just didn't get it done. And Cam Ward gave them two interceptions. Gave them two that interceptions and Cal out. didn't turn the ball over. Cal didn't yeah. Cal lost. Twice. Cal won the uh turnover uh the turnover battle 2 to 0. And lost 28 to 9. And it's not like Washington State has way better players than Cal does. Yeah. 10 points off of 10 possessions. 10 points off of 10 possessions. You mean nine Zero points, points off of 10 off possessions. Of oh my God. Nine. That's right. That's yes. right. <laughs> Less than a point per possession, buddy. And they were in the game. They got to be so frustrated. Their defense has to be so frustrated because they yeah, it was 10 to, held it up. It was seven to three at halftime. It was seven to three at halftime. I don't have anything bad to say about Cal's defense here. I, there's just only so long that you no, the defense keep was going good. out there. Yeah, your was, your offense yeah. has to help you out. They have to help you out because they got to they got to have some quick decision stuff for Jack Plummer too because it's not the long developing plays. He just gets hit. Yep. And then every, he'll go out there and he'll run and he'll give up his body more. And it's just not, nothing's working out for him. So, yeah. And this felt, and on the Washington State side, this is exactly who I thought Cam Ward was. He does good on the quicks. But when he has to sit back there and throw the ball, he's not as efficient at it because he waits on either people to be wide open or for the play to break down so he can then, you know, ad lib, which he, which that's where he's best is ad, ad libbing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we were told, we were told Renard Bell was going to show up this season. And I think this is the first game where I've really seen him do that. Yeah. Eight for um, 115 in a tub. Him. Yep. That's big. And so if he, if he's going to be there for, for Cam Ward, um, moving forward, then I think that, you know, they're going to have some big plays. Yep. And Cal didn't run the ball very well, only ran for a net 31 yards. Uh, uh, Jaden Ott did have 69 yards, but this is just Cal's offense is the thing that's holding them back. Yes. It, and it has to be frustrating for Cal fans to keep running into the same issue. Like their their offense has been a problem for the last – Four years. Mm -hmm. And this feels like a, you know, if you always do what you always done, you always get what you always got. Like you, you, you have to like, they're like, they went from the complete opposite of Sonny Dykes where Sonny Dykes could score, couldn't stop a nosebleed. Now they can't yeah. score. And, and their, their defense gives them an opportunity to win. 
it feels like tone set. It feels like tone setting. And this is the kind of ugly football you can play against teams that are better. You're either going to have a team that you're better than stick around because of you. Yep. Or you're, you're going to muddy things up for a team that is better than you. ASU has been going through this hell. And now, you know, Cal's been doing it for longer than them. So I don't know what to say. It feels like tone setting from the top. They're going to have to do something. They, they made a couple of OC hires that didn't work out. Um, and it, you know, is that because Wilcox wasn't willing to give, well, you know, they're, free, free reign or what? Yeah. But they're, they're also restricted by money too, because when a guy, when your head coach is making like $3 million, it's going to be hard to get an OC that's under, you know, that's around 600,000 or less. Yeah. Like that's going to be tough. So now you have to, you know, so now you got to go with young guys. You know what I mean? Like young guys who are new to the profession or first time OCs. It limits your options. It's just frustrating because you, you're, you have just out there in the world, you got Aaron Rodgers, Marshawn Lynch, Deshaun Jackson, some of the most exciting football players on Under the offensive Jeff side Tepper, of the yeah. ball. Uh, yeah, in the last 15 years, and that, and they're not able to like market that. Yep, not at all. All right, uh, the team that got his coach fired, and Jed Jed Fish out here. Who would have thought that Jed Fish got getting getting coaches fired? Um, Arizona 43, Colorado 20. Dude, if if last if two years ago, I told you that Arizona, prior to Jeff Fish's first game, actually, or even last year at any point, at any point last year, if I told you that Arizona would beat a Pac-12 team by 23 points, would you have believed me? Prior no, to and see, I think yeah, I- even prior to this season. No, prior to the North Dakota State game when they were not favored against an FCS team. <laughs> and, I, and I said on this podcast that the spread wasn't enough. I told so, you, no, man, I, Jed Fish got these dudes out there jumping, man. He's doing the best possible job with what he has. If you are having a bad day or you are having a bad year, there is nobody better to remind you of it than Jaden Delora. He doesn't always show up against the best teams. Or the best schemes, but if you're not on your shit, oh Jamie yeah, Delora he go, will oh ruin yeah, your life. Hey, he threw oh for four eighty four and six touchdowns. That's why they fired the defensive coordinator, and forgot about the offensive coordinator, and they're like, yeah, but we we scored twenty points against Arizona. Their defense is awful, but Arizona overall is getting better. So, so while yeah. I'm saying that their defense is awful, the team, the program, everything around this is getting better. Like, this is something that kids want to sign up for. I'm telling you this right now. From recruiting, they are out in these streets buzzing, bro. Because they're like, oh. Yeah. Oh, because the recruits are like, oh, progress, not perfection. And when you have a – when you have T-Mac – as a freshman is contributing Dorian singer as a walk-on had 160. They have him on scholarship now, but you're, you got a former walk-on a local from pinnacle high school, same high school as Spencer Rattler, nine catches for 163 yards and a touchdown. And then you have Jacob cowing who they brought back home from UTEP. And not only is he living up to the hype, he very, very much belongs in, in like, like he's doing the things that we expected out of Jordan Addison and Jordan Addison looks great. So like the, an exciting offense. 12 for 180 and so a touchdown. Dude, everybody ate. This, this yeah. is one of those games that if you're Arizona, well, their, their backs aren't quite as quite, quite as happy, but all the wide outs. Oh, Nobody's upset. Nobody. They're all like, "Oh, yeah. we're we're all, all their top top guys. We're 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 out here eating, bro." Yeah, and then you have Hunter Eccles who couldn't get on the field at USC, had a sack and a half. So then you you kind of open it up as like, "Oh, this could be a transfer destination." If I'm not, you know, that yep. it's just they're the, the oh, games they like were this hit and the it, portal hard 
in the offseason, and there are going to be people that sign up for it, and then they're going to be better next year. Yeah, because they can point they can point to Jacob Cowing and Jaden Delora the same way that USC can point to Caleb Williams and Jordan Addison. Yep. They're like, hey, yo, yo, we need a we need some corners. Yeah, not everybody could be a Trojan. If, if if they don't want you, you're welcome here. Yep. All right. So is there anything worth talking about about Colorado? Uh, Trevor Woods had 12 solo tackles. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> At the safety position. <laughs> That's what. <laughs> <laughs> That's like Jordan Ooh. Simone 2015 ASU worst pass defense in the country levels where Simone was having to go out there, do all the work himself. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah you'd never this... want to see a safety with 12 solo tackles. No, nope. All right. Uh, Arizona state. USC. This was a game where USC just leaned on them. They just leaned on them. This was a 21 to 17 game at halftime. And USC just like leaned on them and was like, we're better than you. We have better players. And it, it showed like, I, I didn't take anything negative from you from ASU up about this game. Just thought that US USC had more more players. Like that was that was it. They just made a few more plays. And in this in the yeah. first half, I was like, oh, th- this is a game. If ASU can get a stop in the second half, it's a game that could go down to it. But nope. Yeah. Uh my takeaway from this game is I'm 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 now a Caleb Williams believer. And I think I told you this on the phone. There's maybe two dozen quarterbacks playing college football right now that will eventually get an NFL start of some kind. 23 of those quarterbacks could have been the quarterback for USC in this game. And they might have lost because they had some bad center play yes. and some bad tackle play. Yep. yep. He just made plays, bro. Like he, and the <laughs> yeah. cold part was... He didn't he didn't go out there and make throws that you're like, oh my God, like this is the greatest throw. He just managed the game. He got away from sacks and then just efficiently delivered the football. Yes, he did have a, a pick, yeah. but he completed 73% of his passes. This was just a I thought this was Caleb Williams' best game of the whole season. Because yeah. he did because he was under pressure. And he just delivered the football. But this is going to be USC's undoing. This is why USC will not go undefeated this year because of what we saw the last two weeks. If Oregon State had a quarterback, they would have won. If if ASU had a if, if ASU had their team from last year, they pro they have a good chance to win this game. In terms of talent, yeah. talent wise. You don't and, and you can keep Emory Jones back there too. But if you just give them all the players that transferred out, they probably win this game. Cause there is, I mean, even though some of them are on USC's team, um, I I just don't see like, I thought USC should be credited because they did exactly what they were supposed to do. They had a good offensive performance, but you can't be okay because they, they have problems blocking up front. Yeah. And and if anybody yeah. actually sacks Caleb Williams, because he's not Michael Vick. So he can't, or Lamar Jackson, where he can keep, where like, you're like, eventually they're going to get him, but then you're like, no, it's Michael Vick. No, there's going to be somebody that there, or a couple teams that they run into that actually get Caleb Williams on the ground, and he's not able to, you know, avoid all these sacks, and they're going to lose. Or who... Or who aren't surprised that they're like it, that that two seconds after the snap you're standing right next to Caleb Williams. Some of these defensive linemen are good at what they do, but they ha- they they they're they're not used. They're the dog that catches the car. They're not. They don't know what to do once they get there. You're like, oh, oh my god, because they, I'm, I'm, yeah, I am here. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, now, and, so now, how so, do I sack him? Yes. Um, but I, it was, it was a gutsy performance by him. Jordan Addison, once he has the ball in his hands, he did a lot of yards after catch stuff in this game that impressed me. Yep. Um, 
Travis die, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a tragedy and a, and a triumph at the same time. Uh, and then How's it get, a tragedy? just uh, again, because he could be doing that at Oregon. Uh, Oregon. I feel the same way about Eric Gentry on USC's defense. I just, yeah, but I, Oregon, what, Oregon's, it, it, Oregon's happy with, without Travis die though. They have a better back right, right now. Bucky Bucky Irving is better than Travis Travis Die. All right, I'm gonna let you uh, cope. I'm not cope, bro. I'm, a, I'm dead I'm serious, huge bro. Of copium. I'm dead serious. I I could right, not we'll be see. any more more serious, bro. There nobody in Oregon is crying tears about Travis Travis Die. Nobody, not one single person. There, okay, nobody, well, I, I have not one single Oregon fan. And you know, I'm on the boards of all of these uh, teams. Mm-hmm. Not one single mm-hmm. Oregon fan has been on, on either the 24 seven or the on three board being been like, Oh my God, I wish we had Travis die back. We need him back in the room. Nobody. Okay. All right. Well, I personally don't like intra conference trans. I, I want to see people thrive where they go they're more than welcome to do whatever they want but when i look at jacoby covington and i'm like man he could have been in that washington secondary when i look at eric gentry i'm like man, he was a freshman all-american at arizona state i would love to see him finish up on 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 that you know when i look yeah. at uh travis die and i look at what he was doing at oregon it would have been cool to see him finish yes what yes it to- would have been cool and he made a personal mistake by doing that <laughs> And no, no, okay. no, 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 no. And, and, and the reason why I say that is because he's lost. And, and I'm the talking connection. about after, after football is over. Yes. He's yes, lost the connection. Do- like he has severed the tie with the Oregon. They still fool with his brother, but they're like, oh, you, you, you are left. You were one of Oregon's sons. Yes. Yeah. And you're, but you're, now. but you're not yeah. really a Trojan because. You're just a higher gun at this point. So you're not going to be embraced by USC and their network the same way that you would have at Oregon, where you would have been a five year starter. You would have been embraced at Oregon regardless. And the only way you're going to be embraced at USC is if you do something that no one else has done in 10 years. And so, like, so you're not going to be Reggie Bush. You're not going to be Lindell White. You're not going to be OJ. You're not going to be, uh, Charles White, you're not gonna be. Oh, uh, nope. He's not gonna be OJ. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm saying like you're you're, you're not gonna be a USC yeah. guy. So, well, I think you and I are speaking the same language. You, you and I are speaking the same language. Where I do think that people people don't understand the advantages that come with with going through a system, and not everything is in your control. And some business opportunities, all of that, bro. Yeah. Like, yeah, he he would have never. He would have thrived financially after because because he's not a long time NFL player if he makes the NFL. So and what running backs are, but they but yeah. then but then there are there are guys on their team where I'm like okay I get it. Austin Jones probably would have been wasted at Stanford. Brandon yeah. Rice was being wasted at Colorado. But I, but my my I think my main thing is I do want to see when somebody makes a decision to go to a Pac-12 school I want it to work out for them. Yeah. I want it to work out for them. And when they transfer in conference and when you have like 12 of them in a year, it just gets, it just gets dizzying. And every time I see a guy that we've covered, um, I just, you know, it's just a reminder of what, of what was, I don't know. Yep. And in the same way with Arizona state having Xavier Valaday, cause as a Wyoming fan, I'm like, ah, and then USC has Solomon bird. So Solomon bird was tackling Xavier Valaday. And I was, you know, flipping back and forth between watching Wyoming get beat, uh, <laughs> by San Jose State, and I'm like, this is too much. Yep. I will say this about ASU. They looked better. I think some things are working. Brian Thompson coming back and be in this is another intra-conference transfer from Utah. If he's going to give them that deep threat, then that makes them a little more dangerous. But as it stands right now, if I'm going to be honest, Emory Jones is the 10th best quarterback in the Pac-12, and that's not going to cut it. There are now 24 straight games without a 300-yard passer. He had a few interceptions dropped in this game. He is not doing what is necessary, in my opinion. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, uh, next game up. We had Stanford 27, Oregon 45. 
when I looked at this spread, I was like, oh, this is easy work, right? <laughs> right out here. And you Oregon, did that. Mm -hmm. huh? You did say that. Yeah, that this felt like a layup, bro. And just like this weekend at Oregon minus 13 at Arizona, bro, that that's it's gonna be a layup. Uh, but this Oregon team is ever since that uh the Georgia game, this team is averaging almost 50 points a game. Like if you take away that Georgia game, they're averaging 50 points a game. The offense is going crazy. The defense looks good. They are dominating lesser opponents. They are playing like they have a bunch of five and four stars, high four stars on the on the field. Yeah. I mean, and Bo Nix does not have to be the superhero. And when you can run the football, keep him in good situations, situations they're fine but what Oregon did this in the game against Stanford which is not tenable at all was the amount of penalties bro the uh, the amount of penalties was stupid 14 penalties for 135 yards including like six false starts stop it the, you cannot do that you will at lose home. <laughs> yes you cannot do that you will lose against better football teams if you do that against yeah. USC or UCLA you're gonna lose yeah. So I feel you. I just want to point out, uh, surprise, surprise, after week one and, and what we saw from Bo Nix in his fourth career loss to Georgia, Bo Nix is on pace for 3,300 yards passing and 700 yards rushing. <laughs> so Talk don't about look now, Heisman but if, uh, yeah. finalist. No, if he keeps yeah, Bo the, Nix is, this up and Oregon goes 12 and uh, 11 and 1. Oh, he will he will be in New York for the for the Heisman ceremony. Not not saying he's going to win. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. And that and that I mean, it would take some other people falling off, I think. And it but I think people are just going to I don't think it's going to get out of people's mind what happened in week 1, but it's possible he gets to go if 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 he keeps doing this because you also have to understand Yeah, you know what I'm saying? If if 100 yards yeah, yeah, I'm saying if he keeps doing what he's doing right now. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. A 4,000 yard season with, I think, 40 touchdowns that you're responsible for yeah. should get you an invite yes. if you play in a major conference. Yeah, yeah. And if you're one of those teams that's 11 and one and he keeps playing like a, this, he will get an invite because that's, cause that's what they do. They, it, and you would be inside the top five at that point. And you would have, because of the way that things are structured and the fact that Pac-12 is actually getting some national respect, if Oregon was to go 11-1, and one, it would include three to four wins over ranked teams. Yes, yes. O over Washington, Utah, potentially USC, UCLA. Like, yeah, all those things would, would definitely, yeah. Yeah, that's why I say that. All right, so um, Stanford, though. People love Tanner McKee. I don't. He's, he's a statue. He's a statue. Can he throw the ball? Yes. Does he throw a nice ball? Yes. Can he throw the ball all the time? No, because he can't get away from anybody to extend to play. He's, he's, he's Caleb Williams with cement shoes. But you were the one saying that you liked that they took it upon themselves to adopt the slow mesh stuff from Wake Forest. But I didn't think giving, that it was good. Well, well, they they only do the slow mesh. They don't do the rest of the stuff Wake Forest does. I thought that they were. <laughs> they only took that. <laughs> they didn't take the rest of the offense. Yeah, man, he gets hit a lot. And yeah. Stanford, I think it's been a while. Since he was getting frustrated at the end of the game. I would be too. It's funny because I'm looking at Tanner McKee and Jack Plummer doing the Spider-Man meme thing right now because they both throw such a gorgeous deep ball, but you got to be more than that. You got to have escapability. You got to make up for your offensive line if they're yep. not able to hold their blocks. Um, and you got to have people that you can check down to. And uh, I just don't see that happening. And Stanford obviously losing Smith at running back is. Oh um, yeah. And, and, is Filkins, and Filkins every single time he touch, touched the ball after the play. Like what? What are you coming out for every single time you touch the ball, bro? You you gotta suck it up. <laughs> All right. Um, 
I don't know, dude, because if you if you click on his profile picture, I don't know. <laughs> Does that look like a feature running back to you? Nope. That looks like an equipment manager. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now on to our Pac-12 power rankings for this week. What do you have uh, from 12 to 7? Colorado, <laughs> firmly at the bottom. <laughs> There, there's always one team just cemented to the bottom. Yeah, I, I, uh, I thought long and hard about this, but I do think Arizona State would beat Stanford if they played this week, and so I have ASU above Stanford. So ASU is currently in tenth. Um, Arizona in ninth, but the distance between nine and ten is enormous. Uh, and then I have Cal at eight and Washington State at seven. Okay, we have the exact same 12 to 7, except I have Arizona and Cal flipped. Even though Cal beat the shit out of Arizona? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. What, and, and, okay. and, and I know that that feels like a lot, right? Because the uh, previous week, Cal beat them 49 to 31. But listen, I think that after last week, I think that was a bad game for Arizona, but, but I can't argue with, with, with your logic in that, like they just beat them a week ago, but I'm doing like a, a AP poll voters where I'm saying okay. this, <laughs> this week though, they were way better. They beat them. If you <laughs> nine times out of 10, they'd beat them. So I'm, I'm acting like Recent. an AP poll voters. Yeah. So I, I'll have my AP vote pretty soon. Um, There's recency bias and recency insanity. Yes. All right, who do you have six through one? Oregon State, which is amazing because if they had uh, if they had any one of nine other quarterbacks, <laughs> I think that they are top Dude, four if team. You give them J- if you give them even Jaden Delora, they oh are sick. Oh, my God. Yeah, or give, yeah. give them Cam, Cam Ward. Way better. But now imagine if you gave them um, uh, Cam, Cam Rising. Who He'd runs a similar so offense? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, so I have I have Oregon State at six, Washington at five, UCLA at four because of results, and uh, and then USC at three, Oregon at two, and Utah at number one. I do feel like the distance between one and two is almost as big as the distance between eight or nine and ten. Like I, I you mean Utah to me is is way out there right now. Um, just they're playing complete football games. Yeah. See, now we are the same in your six to one, except for I have uh, Oregon State at five and Washington at six. So Washington fell from one to six, bro, for me last last <laughs> week. Because I thought that they had earned one, right? I thought that they had earned yeah. one. But then they lost to a team that I had fifth. So I'm like, eh, I don't know. I don't I know. That. Yeah. I so that. yeah, and I have UCLA fourth, USC third, Oregon second, and Utah first. All right. Now, okay. now for this week, uh, well, actually, first, how did we do last week with our picks? Because because we did have a re- review that was like, do not listen to their picks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do not take gambling advice from, and I think that's more mainstream gambling advice because again. Uh, I went to the thing that all I on our Friday picks that we do. Um, I'm having the worst season of all time. I've not, I'm, I'm usually around 55%. Uh, and this season it's, I was six and like 13 going into this week. So the one thing that I can always get healthy on is finding unders to pick. So I went yeah. all unders this week <laughs> and I went one and f- I went one and four. Uh. <laughs> so like it suit, I, I don't know what to do, but on the pack 12 end, we actually, after two weeks ago, going two and four, we both recovered well. You went five and one, and I went four and two. Nice, nice, nice. Be the leader of the pack. All right. <laughs> um. So you know, because you know, I me, mean. humble, humble, humble. Um. All right. So we have five games this week. First, all of them on Saturday. We have Utah at UCLA. What's the line on this game? Utah and UCLA currently has Utah minus three and a half on the road. 
Oh, man. Now, can UCLA strike twice, right? Can they strike twice? I am going to say no. I am going to go with Utah, but they're not going to get blown out. I think it'll be like a six-point victory. So I, I got Utah minus three and a half. I think Utah is the best team in the conference. Uh, they have historically been bad in LA, but they they are ridding themselves of all of their ills. Yep, they're just shedding off all of this stuff that has been uh, sort of the bugaboo for for them. And they did struggle with Anthony Richardson's athleticism, but Cam Rising also blew that game with an errant throw at the at the end of the game. The Rose Bowl is not going to be the same environment as the Swamp. Is going to be 75 and dry and 45,000 fans. So give me Utah and I feel the same. It might, it, UCLA might keep it close, but I do like Utah to, to win by about a touchdown. Yeah, I don't see a scenario where USC ends up being able to. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, well, I guess there is a scenario where UCLA wins. I just don't think that that is probably the most likely scenario that that USC I'm sorry that U, UCLA ends up encountering. So, do I believe they can win? Yes. Do I believe they're going to win? No. Yeah. Because if, if they win the- this game, DTR's confidence is going to reach a level that is like 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 he's going to think he's Thanos. And oh, UCLA yeah, no. may not lose again. <laughs> if he reaches Thanos status, if well actually if they're able to beat Washington last week, come back with Utah, beat Utah, have a week off, and then if they beat Oregon, dude, he's then Thanos. He's then Thanos. USC's going, UCLA's going to the college football playoff if they beat Utah and Oregon. Book it. Book it. <laughs> because, because after that... Who the hell is going to beat them? Stanford, Arizona State, Arizona, Cal, USC is the only team that would have a chance to beat them. The fact that you're thinking about a Pac-12 team going undefeated in conference makes me nervous because we don't do that here. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, I don't know where you're from, but are you new around here? uh, It it doesn't happen. The Black Black Panther meme. (laughs) We do not do that here. Yeah. (laughs) All right, so, uh, yeah, so that's the pick. Next game, Washington at Arizona State. This is a daytime kickoff, a 1 p.m. Okay. Pacific kickoff. Um, what's the line in that game? Washington minus 14. Really? USC yeah. only won by 17, right? So yes. it's, it's going to be... That, and that was... And ASU had the ball twice in the third quarter with the ability to take the lead. Uh, And so it was closer than the 17 would suggest. Yeah. So it's going to be 90 degrees on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Hasn't the temperature in Seattle is in the 60s. This game's in Tempe. Tempe, Phoenix, same uh, place. I was, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I was saying that that's going to be the the temperature in Phoenix, Tempe. Um, you said but, yeah, you said Seattle. No, said no, Seattle. no, 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 no. I said Seattle after. So I was I was just giving uh, the reference for sure. the temperature in Seattle. Uh, yeah, it's in okay. the. So today it's sixty three. It'll be on Saturday. It'll be seventy three there. So ninety is a big difference. At one o'clock. Yep. That's uh, it's in in the dark jerseys. <laughs> yep. So, get this: the last time that Washington won in Tempe, you were playing at Oregon. How many times did they play down there? That was twenty two years ago. No, no, no. Twenty yeah, years it was ago. Two thousand one season. Yeah. So that's twenty one years ago. So. How many times have they played down there? Like eight, maybe seven, eight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Including coming in as the number five ranked team in the country and losing to Manny Wilkins. Dude, the Arizona is the place where like records and, and 
and uh, dreams go to die. Yes, yes, yes. Oregon had a dream die there a couple years ago in 2019. Thanks, thanks. Had another Gil. one in Tucson, right? Yep. Yeah. All right. So give oh give me Arizona State all day. If this is a 17 point line, I, I don't give me Arizona State, please. Okay. Give me all of it. This feels like layup time. This feels like Minnesota minus 27. This feels like Oregon minus 17 last week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, layup, bro. Arizona State has the longest streak in the country of not giving up 50-yard plays. Uh, And Washington is a big play offense. Something's going to give there. Uh, Michael Penix is not as mobile (laughs) as as uh Caleb Williams. Yep. Uh and it's possible he's going to take a couple of hits in this game. Washington is by far the more talented team, but I don't see two touchdowns in Tempe. Um I don't think Arizona State's winning this game, but no. I definitely don't think it's going to be two touchdowns. So give me Arizona State plus 14. Oh, it's 14. I thought it was 17. Mm. 14, yeah. All right. Uh 14 is a little more, but I'm still taking Arizona State. All right, we okay. got Washington State at USC. If this game were in the Palouse, I would feel a little bit differently about it, but uh, but I need to know the line first. USC is actually favored by 12 and a half. That makes sense. That makes sense, sort of, because USC, they throw the ball well, obviously. Washington State mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily throw the ball well, but Washington State just extends plays and makes stuff muddy. They make it muddy. Oh, man. All right. I am going to go with Washington. I think USC ultimately wins the game, but I'm going to take Washington State because, as you saw against Oregon, they will keep fighting until the very last second, even if they can't win. So they're going to crush the spread. Even if they're down by like 18 with 30 seconds to go, they're going to end up crushing this spread and breaking somebody's heart. Give me Washington State. I feel the same way. Their only loss, obviously, is, you know, Oregon's comeback. Um, Oregon was able to move the ball at will in that game, but, you know, we know how it turned out. Uh, I think that the problem for Washington State is they'll turn the ball over. USC just isn't doing that. They're yep. not. They've won turnover this year. Uh, so uh, without extra chances, I don't see a chance for Ooh, Washington I State to win. Love what you did there. But 12 and a half is, man, it's right there too because I could see a 13-point win like clear as day. I'm still going to stick with Washington State on this one. Mm, yep. Going with road dogs is always tough, especially multiple road dogs. So Hopefully there are not too many more of those. (laughs) I know, right? All right. The next game up, Oregon at Arizona. This is definitely not a road dog. Um, This game's on Pac-12 Network. Oh, so I didn't even tell you guys. So the Utah-UCLA is on Fox with Tim Brando and Spencer Spencer Tillman. Washington-Arizona State's on Pac-12 Network with J.B. Long and Lincoln Kennedy. Um, uh, Washington State... And USC is on Fox with Noah Eagle and Mark Helfrich. Um, the Oregon Arizona game is on Pac-12 Network with Ted Robinson and Yogi Roth, and the Oregon State Stanford game is on ESPN with Mark Jones, Robert Griffin III, and and Quint Kasate, uh, Kasinich. All right, so Oregon Arizona, what's the line on this game? Thirteen. Oregon is a thirteen point favorite. This is an absolute layup. G- give me Oregon all day. Easy work. They're probably going to win by 24. You think so? Yes. All right. Well, because you, you just jumped Arizona above Cal and all your excitement about what they what they were able to achieve. Yeah, th- I, I think they're just swim, swimming in the deep end here, buddy. Do you think... I mean, it's in Tucson and it's at night. Could be tough, maybe. I I don't know. It, it thirteen is a lot. The over under seventy. Um, yes. Yes. So 
So, so if the over under is 70, right? So if you split that in half, that's 35 each. You take 13 away. So that gives them 23. So that's 23 to wait. No, 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 no. So that ends up. So, so that's 35. Yes. So that's 35 minus seven is 28 plus six. So 41, so 41, 28. Okay. Which will put you right under. Yep. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that actually feels kind of think... reasonable, but, but yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go like, I, I got like 45, 45, 25, 45, 24, mm-hmm. which would put you right I under. Wanna... Yeah. I want to go with Arizona in this game, but, but, but. <laughs> You know who you, you you know who calls plays for Oregon? Kenny Dillingham. He wants a job. And you know what? And you know what state this game's being played in? Arizona. This is an audition. Oh my God! He it might, is he, he he might be having a meeting the night before the game. Why Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he? Arizona State's at home. I'm telling you, they are seriously considering Kenny Dillingham. They are. Arizona State is. He is on. They they have an internal list of stuff they're looking at. I'm not sure they're going to go the the route of a search firm. They're taking the Kenny Dillingham thing seriously. And Kenny Kenny Dillingham coming to the state of Arizona when the Arizona State game is going to be over, and so everybody in Arizona who has the Pac-12 network is going to be able to watch Kenny Dillingham work against the team they hate. Mm. This is important. Yeah, oh, it really is for point. his. So uh, I guess give me Oregon. Give me Oregon. Hate it, but give me Oregon. <laughs> nice. All right. Last game on the slate: Oregon State at Stanford. I don't care. I don't care about this line. Oregon State's winning this football game. Well, actually, their quarterback play stinks, bro. What's the What's the line? Is Stanford favored? No, no, no. It's Oregon State by seven. On the road. On ESPN for everybody to watch. I cannot believe the Oregon Arizona game isn't the one that's on national TV. The Oregon State, Oregon State, after the last two weeks of playing in obscurity, has to go out there. <laughs> now they get a national televised game. Hey, they didn't they didn't want last week's game televised, but they did want the USC one tele televised. All right. Do you know why? Do you want do you want to know why this game is important? Why? The loser is going to be at least 0-3 in Pac-12 play because Stanford's 0-3 now and Oregon State's 0-2. Oh, that doesn't matter. Neither neither one of these teams was winning the conference anyway. But but it does. This is this would be a bad loss for Oregon State because this puts their bowl chances at sketchy. Yeah, because they're three and two right right now. This will give them a fourth win, which will put them squarely at an opportunity. All they need is two wins out of their last six games. Two. Yeah. As opposed to needing three, when you have like Washington, Oregon, Washington State left on the schedule. I think they still got Cal and um yeah. Yeah, it it it, it could get sketchy. So this is a, a game they need to win if they want to go to a bowl game. Yeah, I think the way to beat Oregon State is to overpower them. Uh, and I don't see Stanford doing that. So I like Oregon State to win. Seven on the road is a lot, but what choice do you have? The other option is to go with Stanford, and that feels like a bad <laughs> idea. So I uh, will ride with Oregon State. And I am too, dude. I, but, but, but I will say, I don't love it. I don't love it. All right, so the the last thing we have to talk about, though, is Arizona State and their head coaching job, searching job. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that Kenny Dillingham is on the short list. Is Brennan Marion even being considered for this job? He is. Who he do you is. think they end he, up – who who else is on the list? Sean Aguano, who okay, is currently – Who's the interim head coach right now? 
Yes. And then I think that there are some, some other outside the box guys that they're considering. I don't think they've thrown away the idea that Jonathan Smith would leave Oregon state, but I, to me, why, why would you go? Like, I, I don't I don't understand the Jonathan Smith thing and he gets floated out for every single job. I don't get it. I think he's in the perfect place for him. Um, but his offensive coordinator, Brian Lindgren, is somebody who they might look at. Uh, and also former University of Virginia head coach Bronco Mendenhall is someone I think that they're taking a serious look at. And Bronco has had uh, he did have some success at Virginia, but that's the other part about a retread so virginia wants to win so like why do we think it'll work at asu now right and i what i worry about is is bringing some you want to bring in somebody who's just going to do the right thing you don't want to bring in somebody who's i talked to somebody last night about this and i said look whoever comes to arizona state they're they're going to need to basically have a presentation ready on compliance and what that person said back to me because we were talking about brennan marion what that person said back to me is the answer just needs to be how you do anything is how you do everything. Yep. How you do anything is how you do everything. So any candidate that is approaching the Arizona state job that isn't a hundred percent all in on the idea of being compliant uh, is going to be somebody that they dismiss outright. It has to be a priority for them. It just shouldn't be the only thing. There's so many things that need addressed at Arizona state, Correct. whether it's, you know, in um, in-state recruiting, reestablishing the footprint of um, of Arizona state maintaining the academics, which have continued to get uh, better and better. But uh, so, but here is my, here is my current proposal because we still don't have the notice of allegations delivered from the NCAA. Mm. Right. And Ray Anderson came out and he said, we're going to give Sean Guano an honest crack at this thing. There is no such thing as an honest crack at being an interim head coach. No, because how are you going to recruit as interim? You, you literally can't do it. Sean Guano just had 70 of the top, players in in arizona high school football out at practice yesterday here yeah. is here is what i'm going to float because the notice of allegations has not been delivered yet i think it might might behoove arizona state to extend the interim tag through the end of 2023 mm. because that's what an honest well, shot at well or or what you could do is and that, that that's actually not a bad idea to extend the interim tag. But what ASU is going to have to do is probably give him a con, whoever the new head coach is, a contract like uh, they they gave Josh Heupel over at Tennessee. They're like, listen, we know allegations are coming. Like, we, we know this. So we are going to guarantee you enough money and guarantee you enough time to fix it and to deal with whatever penalties come down the pipe. That way we can't fire you during during this time yeah so that way we tie ourselves enough to you that way you have enough time so i think that that's what arizona state's going to have to do if they want a good head coach they're gonna have to be like all right look you can take this job and we know that this situation sucks but we will make sure to give you the time resources and energy to give you a chance to be successful I agree. I, I agree. And, and, and at the same time, based on the seriousness of, of some of the stuff that they're facing um, and the idea that they said they were going to give Sean Aguano a shot, I don't personally believe that nine games against, you know, w with three ranked teams at the very beginning of that schedule um, and, and no ability to be able to tell the recruits that are part of how you're going to be judged, uh, that you're actually going to be there next year. I don't think that's an honest shot. So either they need to say, thanks, for your service, Sean Aguano, but your tenure is up at the end of this year and we're moving forward without you, or they need to seriously consider the fact that these allegations are coming down the pike and they need to give him one more year to figure out if if he can actually do a uh, an in-person proof of concept moving yep. forward. That's the way I feel. It'll never happen, but that's the way I feel about it because uh, it, it, to say that you're judging somebody based on if they can collect some players and get them to commit to you when you're not even going to be able to tell those players whether you'll be back that's going to be the thing that precludes those players from committing to you. So, yep. I don't know. I just, I want them to be upfront and honest with Sean Aguano. This guy I care about a lot and I want to see him have success, whatever his next step is. Um, but I do know they are taking the name Kenny Dillingham very seriously and Brennan Marion as well. Um, and that Bron Bronco Mendenhall is somebody that for what he did at BYU at Virginia is someone that they, they would, 
they would uh, strongly consider. But the issue for Arizona State now becomes you can have guys on a short list, but now you have competition. It's it's one thing if you're three got three candidates for one open job, but now Colorado's open and Georgia yeah, Tech's is, open. Yeah. And Nebraska's open and Wisconsin's open. Because one of the guys I would have said if Wisconsin hadn't have fired is I would have said throw the bag at Jim Leonard. Yeah, he's gonna go home when the when the time comes. But like that's a dude that you definitely would want. And, oh, for sure. You know, for sure. Because now, worst case now scenario, he's locked up. you know your 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 defense is going to be trill trill entertainment television. All right, mm-hmm. you guys. I'm George Reister. He's Ralph Amson. That's the Pac-12 Apostles. Hopefully, you guys have a great weekend. Enjoy the game. Share the podcast with a friend. Tell everybody about it. Continue uh, it to grow. Peace out. Catch you guys later.